You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, my friends, to episode 174 of The Corbett Report podcast, Patriot Mythology. Pop quiz. What do the following three quotations have in common? Number one. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Thomas Jefferson Number 2. The bold effort the present central bank has made to control the government are but premonitions of the fate that await the American people should they be deluded into a perpetuation of this institution or the establishment of another like it. I am one of those who do not believe that a national debt is a national blessing, but rather a curse to a republic, inasmuch as it is calculated to raise around the administration a moneyed aristocracy dangerous to the liberties of the country. Gentlemen, I have had men watching you for a long time, and I am convinced that you have used the funds of the bank to speculate in the breadstuffs of the country. When you won, you divided the profits amongst you, and when you lost, you charged it to the bank. You tell me that if I take the deposits from the bank and annul its charter, I shall ruin 10,000 families. That may be true, gentlemen, but that is your sin. Should I let you go on, you will ruin 50,000 families, and that would be my sin. You are a den of vipers and thieves. You are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out, and by the grace of the eternal God, will rout you out. Andrew Jackson Number three. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now much more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national autodetermination practiced in past centuries. David Rockefeller Well, long-time listeners to the Corporate Report podcast will no doubt recognize at least one of those quotations, the quotation from Andrew Jackson, as one that we went over in episode 125 and found to be almost certainly spurious. That is to say, Andrew Jackson almost certainly did not utter those words in that way. And we went over the reasons for that in an article that we delved into in that episode. Sorry, Andrew Jackson probably never said that Den of Thieves quote. And similarly, the Thomas Jefferson quotation about the inflation and deflation, and the David Rockefeller quotation about how the press had enabled the Bilderbergers to further their plans for world domination, almost certainly were not said in those words in that way at those times that they are commonly ascribed to them. That is to say, they are spurious quotations of questionable origin. And yet, they are almost universally and uncritically parroted and copied in alternative media time and time again. This goes to the very point of today's episode, and that perhaps is best encapsulated in a famous quotation to the effect that the best way to refute an argument is to defend it poorly. Now, I will give you a source on that quotation, but ironically enough, I can't remember. I believe it was Friedrich Nietzsche who said that somewhere in his writings, but I can't find the exact quotation, so I won't make it up out of thin air. But that is the exact point. We may be fairly certain that Andrew Jackson did utter something to the effect of the Den of Thieves quote at some point, or at least held those views, or at least that those views are correct and true and do apply to the real world, But that does not mean that we can just go ahead and say that he said those words without some sort of source for that quotation. Or similarly, if we look into the Thomas Jefferson quotation, 
we find that that quotation has in fact not been discovered anywhere in Thomas Jefferson's writings, and that it has been marked as spurious by respectfully quoted, and many others have pointed out that the words inflation and deflation were not used in an economic sense until the 20th century, meaning Jefferson almost certainly did not use them in that quotation in that way. So where did they come from? Well, they were put into his mouth many years later by someone who may even have had the best intention of thinking this is what Jefferson truly thought or believed, but when we put words into someone's mouth, obviously it is not the same as them saying it, and we can't just go ahead and assert that they did say it. Similarly with the Rockefeller quotation. This quotation supposedly comes from remarks delivered to the Bilderberg Group meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany in June of 1991, but as we know, of course, with the Chatham House rules, which forbid participants of the Bilderberg Group, Bilderberg Group meetings from actually reporting on what was said specifically by anyone at the group, these remarks were probably not given word for word verbatim by someone with some sort of recording device. Of course, there is no actual source document from which these words come. They were uh, supposedly delivered orally and then not actually recorded at the time. So where do we get this word for word quotation, which contains the, the very juicy tidbit, the supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in centuries. That is something that all of us listening to this podcast likely feel that David Rockefeller believes, but again, it is not the same as him actually saying it. And I'm not here to say that he did not say those words. Perhaps he did. But once again, the chain of custody on that quotation, so to speak, is severely wanting. And we can't just go around asserting that he said it without some sort of documentation for it. Because once again, if we defend our side of an argument poorly by relying on quotations that were likely made out of th made up out of thin air, or at the very least that we can't prove were not made up out of thin air, then we are are standing on intellectual quicksand, and we will sink because of it. In the past, I myself have promoted things which I no longer would promote because I do no longer think they have a rational or sound basis, and we'll get into some of those things in today's episode. But as another case in point on the quotations front, I was recently writing the script for a video that I will be putting out in the near future on the subject of overpopulation that I found in an article called What the Malthusians Say that would have helped my argument immensely, such as this, ar this quotation from Bertrand Russell. I have already spoken of the population problem, but a few words must be added about its political aspect. It will be impossible to feel that the world is in a satisfactory state until there is a certain degree of equality and a certain acquiescence everywhere in the power of the world government, and this will not be possible until the poorer nations of the world have become more or less stationary in population. Or this quotation from Michael Silverstein, president of Environmental Economics. If necessary, nations of the third world must be forced to remain poor if their development threatens resources on which all life depends. As I say, those quotations would have been immensely helpful in me constructing the argument that I was constructing for that video, but since I could not find an actual source for those statements, either in, an, in the writings of those people or in an interview that had been published in some, some sort of respectable place, because there was no real way for me to pin down where those quotations came from, and no way for me to say that the author of the article didn't make them up out of whole cloth, I did not use them, and I will not use them, until such time as they can be shown to me to have come from the sources that, that the people are saying they came from. And that is, again, not to say that these quotations are necessarily spurious, but simply that we have to be able to prove where they come from before we go around promoting them. So at this point, I'd like to turn to another piece of what I call patriot mythology, that is to say, things that have been widely set, disseminated and spread and are now almost taken for granted as being true, despite the fact that their actual intellectual backing and premises are not exactly on sturdy ground. And for our next piece, let's turn to the JFK assassination. See, John, JFK... Our first Catholic president, John, was the most charismatic of the presidents and had 
great support from the American people and he felt that he could defy the international bankers and get away with it. He wasn't just killed because he was favoring some rights for black people. The president has power to just, with an executive order, make a law. I'm almost finished. Executive order 11110 signed into law early 1963 where with the stroke of his pen he took away the power of the Federal Reserve to print the money and he John Kennedy boy this is something he put four billion dollars into circulation in two dollar and five dollar denominations but all four billion was backed by silver six months later like it was with Lincoln he was shot down in Dealey Plaza. Or so the story goes, and there the story is put forward by none other than Louis Farrakhan, but I have absolutely no doubt that my listeners have probably encountered that story numerous other times from numerous other people, and again, I'm not here to single anyone out and to put any ridicule on anyone in particular for espousing this view. It has gone around and has been featured in uh, works that even I myself still ad- adhere to and would still recommend to people like uh, Jim Mars' Crossfire, which is an incredible uh, overview of the JFK case as it stood in 1989. And... Uh, and it's an extremely uh, detailed and wonderful book in a lot of ways and, and has really obviously contributed to so many things, including Oliver Stone's uh, movie and many other things. But uh, he was also a proponent of this idea that Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110 that supposedly uh, pr- uh, issued billions of dollars in U.S. notes or silver certificates, and sometimes those are used interchangeably even though they're not the same thing. And this was somehow uh, the end of the Fed or the coming end of the Fed or he was phasing out Federal Reserve notes or something to that effect. And just a few months later, lo and behold, he was killed. And the idea is that Kennedy was standing up to the banksters and the banksters gunned him down. And that's something that seems to fit with a lot of pieces of the puzzle because obviously it's something that we had seen uh, previously. Of course, Andrew Jackson being an example of someone who was attempted to be assassinated because of uh, because of his uh, ideas about uh, the bank. And then there was Abraham Lincoln, who I think a lot of the, the evidence shows was gunned down because of his uh, various ventures into currencies and things that the banksters did not like. And then, well, it seems to fit a sort of historical pattern. So was JFK gunned down by the banksters? Well, perhaps not. And in order to flesh that out, why don't we turn to someone that many people think is an authority on the Federal Reserve and has literally written the book on the subject, none other than G. Edward Griffin of freedomforceinternational.org. And back in 2000, he had an article entitled simply The JFK Myth, which breaks it down and shows that, well, maybe JFK and Executive Order 11110 is not the way that many, in fact, I would say these days, most people portray. Quote, What EO 11110 did was to modify previous Executive Order 10289, delegating to the Secretary of the Treasury various powers of the President. To these delegated powers, EO 11110 added the power to alter the supply of silver certificates in circulation. Executive Order 11110, therefore, did not create any new authority for the Treasury to issue notes. It only affected who could give the order, the Secretary or the President. 
The reason for the move was that the president had just signed legislation repealing the Silver Purchase Act. With this repeal, the Treasury Secretary could no longer control the issue of silver certificates on his own authority. However, the issuance of certificates could could be controlled under the president's authority. Hence, for administrative convenience, President Kennedy issued Executive Order 11110. Ironically, the purpose of the order and the legislation was to decrease the circulation of silver certificates, with Federal Reserve notes taking their place. As economic activity grew and prices rose in the 1950s and early 1960s, the need for small denomination currency grew at the same time that the price of silver increased. The Treasury required silver for the increasing number of silver certificates and coins needed for transactions, but the price of silver was rapidly approaching the point that the silver in the coins, and in reserve for the certificates, was worth more than the face value of the money. To conserve on the silver needs of the Treasury, President Kennedy requested legislation needed to bring the issuance of silver certificates to an end and to authorize the Fed to issue small denomination notes, which it could not at that time. The Fed began issuing small denomination notes almost immediately after the legislation was passed, and in October 1964, the Treasury ceased issuing silver certificates altogether. If anything, EO11110 enhanced Federal Reserve power and did not in any way reduce it. Let's put this issue into perspective. The proponents of the JFK myth assert that Kennedy was assassinated because he was about to issue silver certificates, thereby denying the bankers their customary interest payments on the nation's currency. However, the reality was just the opposite. Previously, the president could have issued silver certificates on his own authority. But with the signing of EO1110, he delegated that authority to the Secretary of the Treasury. At that time, the Secretary of the Treasury was Douglas Dillon from a well-known and powerful banking family. That means Kennedy surrendered the power to issue silver certificates and gave it to a member of the banking fraternity who could do with it as he pleased without the approval, ratification, or other action of the president. Dillon, of course, would have strong motive to preserve the dominance of Federal Reserve notes. The theory that Kennedy was getting ready to issue silver certificates is without evidence or logic. The persistent rumor regarding the banker's role in JFK's death was reinforced by several books circulated in conservative circles. They contained an ominous passage from Kennedy's speech at Columbia University just 10 days before his assassination. He is quoted as saying, The high office of president has been used to foment a plot to destroy the Americans' freedom, and before I leave office I must inform the citizen of his plight. However, when Columbia University was contacted to provide a transcript of the speech, it was learned that Kennedy never spoke there, neither 10 days before his assassination, nor at any other time. Now, tellingly, at the end of that article, Mr. Griffin appends some correspondence that he had with one of his readers about his statements about the JFK myth, because the reader was quite irate that he had swallowed the pill hook, line, and sinker and believed the story that these uh, silver certificate issuances were of just a routine occurrence and of no particular significance. And it is, uh, it is interesting the degree to which people will attack those who are going against what they want to believe, even if the facts of the matter seem to indicate the other way. And again, I'm open to always being corrected, and I do not posit that I am always 100% infallible. In fact, uh, I myself have, of course, pointed to things in the past that I now no longer adhere to. So it's very important that none of us take ourselves too seriously or believe in ourselves to be so flawless that we can never admit revision, revision to our beliefs based on the available evidence. So the best I can do is to go with the evidence that I have and put it together in the best way I can. But again, that's why I always stress for people not to just sit here and take my word for everything, but to look at the facts for yourself and to come to your own conclusions. I am not here to tell you how to think, nor is anybody else, although there are many psychopathic individuals, manipulative individuals, who will gladly do your thinking for you if you want to go back, just sit back and allow the information to soak into your brain and not to actually question what you're receiving. Well, 
now that we've tackled that myth, and it is a very powerful one, and I have absolutely no doubt will persist and continue, and many people will be absolutely convinced, despite the evidence to the contrary, that Kennedy was opposed to the Fed and the banksters. But at any rate, let's move on to another one, and this one, if not equally contentious, is probably going to be even more contentious. But again, if we don't look at the facts and face them for what they are, then we will never get anywhere close to the truth, and that's all I am interested in. So, let's look at the next myth, the myth that the so-called Fat Bin Laden confession video is a fake. On December 14, 2001, the government released a tape, allegedly of Bin Laden confessing to the attacks of September 11th, which they claim to find in a house in Kandahar, Afghanistan, except there's a number of things wrong with this tape. One, the tape itself is of very poor quality. And two, the man in the video looks and acts nothing like bin Laden. According to the FBI's website, Osama is left-handed. Yet, in this video, he's writing a note with his right hand. Compare this video to four other pictures of bin Laden. Does anybody else see a problem here? Now, I'm sure my listeners don't need to be told that that was Dylan Avery narrating Loose Change, or an earlier edition of Loose Change, and talking about the infamous, the now infamous Osama bin Laden confession take, tape that was released on December 13th, 2001 by the Pentagon, and supposedly shows Osama bin Laden confessing to masterminding and talking about the uh, 9-11 attacks and how he planned them in advance. Now, that obviously is a huge cornerstone in the official story of 9-11, and is still to this day something that is officially looked upon as the the sign that Osama bin Laden was responsible for 9-11 and thus that the invasion of Afghanistan and everything that has followed in the war on terror has been justified. Now, for obvious reasons, the 9-11 truth movement rejects that premise and rejects the video, but the problems that have been raised about the video may not bear scrutiny. Well, before we start getting into the details, why don't we actually start looking at this video and what it supposedly contains. And for, for that, we'll go back to December 13th of 2001, the day that this videotape was released, for a report from NPR. Under the headline, Pentagon releases Bin Laden videotape, U.S. officials say tape links him to September 11th attacks. Quote, The Pentagon has released a videotape of Osama Bin Laden that it says provides additional evidence that the Al-Qaeda leader is responsible for the September 11th terror attacks. Administration officials say the tape shows bin Laden had specific knowledge of when and where those attacks would occur before they took place. The videotape, discovered in a private home in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, shows a relaxed bin Laden discussing the attacks in Arabic with another man who appears to be a cleric. On the tape, bin Laden says he was pleasantly surprised by the amount of destruction caused at the World Trade Center. He only expected the top portion of the Twin Towers to collapse. According to a translated transcript issued by the Pentagon, Bin Laden says the attacks on the World Trade Center did more damage than expected. We calculated in advance the number of casualties from the enemy who would be killed based on the position of the tower, he says, according to the transcript. We calculated that the floors that would be hit would be three or four floors. I was the most optimistic of them all, inaudible, due to my experience in the field, I was thinking that the fire from the gas in the plane would hit, melt the iron structure of the building and collapse the area where the plane hit, and all the floors above it only. This is all that we had hoped for. Bin Laden also indicates on the tape that he knew of the attacks in advance. We had notification since the previous Thursday that the event would take place that day, he says. We had finished our work that day and had the radio on. It was 5.30pm our time. Immediately, we heard the news that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. We turned the radio station to the news from Washington. The news continued and no mention of the attack until the end. At the end of the newscast, they reported that a plane just hit the World Trade Center. End quote. Well, and that obviously was the bombshell news of December 2001 that seemed to, ju to justify the war on terror and the attack that was already taking place in Afghanistan at that time. But for many people, this account left a lot to be desired, and for very good reasons. For one, the, uh, the exact narrative of the discovery of this incredible confession videotape, uh, well, that changed a few times over the course of the preceding and proceeding months. But 
Eventually, the official narrative was that this videotape was discovered in an Al-Qaeda safe house in Jalalabad when U.S. forces took over the house and they walked in and the videotape was playing as they walked in. Well, there you go. That's quite coincidental. And uh, hey, look, there was Osama bin Laden. I wonder what he's saying. Oh, he's confessing to 9-11. Well, well, miraculous discovery. Well, so that's the official narrative of how this came, and the official narrative says that this videotape was recorded in November of 2001, while the bombing was already taking place in Afghanistan, and the bombs were raining down among these people, and as uh, Osama bin Laden was sitting there discussing with the paraplegic sheikh, apparently they were in a war-ravaged country that was being bombed at the moment, and in the entire conversation, Well, they didn't mention anything whatsoever about the war that was raging around them. Not once. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And this paraplegic sheikh traveled hundreds of miles to come meet Osama bin Laden. And uh, and yet they didn't discuss that. Well, that's an odd feature of this videotape. But uh, the the key point of this videotape that uh, the truth movement has had problems with is really not actually looking at the video itself, but just looking at screen grabs of the video. And if you look at a screen grab, especially just a screen grab of Osama bin Laden, and blow it up and take a look at it and compare it side to side with other pictures of Osama bin Laden, well, it's clearly not Osama bin Laden. It's clearly a fat person sitting there, and it's a a fat man pretending to be Osama bin Laden wearing a fake beard. It is not Osama. Or so the uh, story goes in the alternative media, and uh, the 9-11 truth movement seems quite unified on that point. Of course, when you actually bother to go and look at the video itself, there is no doubt that this is Osama bin Laden or a dead ringer or an incredibly detailed and incredibly accurate computer-generated facsimile, whatever you want to believe. But at any rate, the the idea that this is a fat bin Laden is a misconception. And it is a misconception that has occurred for a very specific technical reason. And that technical reason is that this tape was originally PAL format, and it was converted to NTSC without using the proper conversion And for people who don't know what I'm talking about, well, PAL and NTSC are the two main video formats in the world, and Europe, for example, tends to use PAL, and North America tends to use NTSC. And when you convert the two formats, since they write the images on the screen in different ways, well, when you convert them, the the conversion process should take that into account, and the uh, the aspect ratio, the length-to-width ratio of the screen should remain intact. But when it's not properly converted, you get this effect where extra lines are added in or some lines are taken out, which either makes it squishy or makes it elongated. In this case, you get an elongated-looking fat Osama bin Laden. But if you take the video and actually do the proper conversion, you end up with the exact image of Osama bin Laden we all know, which shows that it was an PAL NTSC conversion error. Now, there are a lot of things going on here and a lot of things to do with this tape, but ultimately what starts to emerge is the fact that this video, of course, is not in line with the Pentagon narrative of the video, but it is not in line with the commonly held conception of the 9-11 truth movement either, that it is simply a fake, a man in a fat suit or a, an actor trying to portray bin Laden. It really is bin Laden. But the tape was taken not in November of 2001, but in September of 2001, and not by someone who was sitting there with a handheld camera pointing at Osama bin Laden while he talked to the camera, but to someone who was wearing a hidden camera. This is where it gets interesting, because what we're dealing with with this video is not a video of a man confessing to 9-11. It is a video of a man who is being secretly recorded by people participating in a sting operation led by U.S. intelligence. Every war needs an enemy. Every enemy needs a face. And through propaganda, this face instills public fear. On the sixth anniversary of 9-11, news programs are touting a new video from Osama bin Laden. It looks like a forgery, but that's for another time. Today, we focus on the original bin Laden confession video, because contrary to what you've been told, the true story of the video's origin may prove that the Bush administration did not want to capture bin Laden after 9-11. Instead, it wanted war. Welcome to Collateral. (laughs) 
The bin Laden confession video became the smoking gun evidence that bin Laden was responsible for the 9-11 attacks. We were told that the video was found in Jalalabad, Afghanistan in late November 2001 and that the video was filmed by unknown persons. By November 2001, of course, Afghanistan lay in ruins, having been bombarded by the U.S. for several weeks. Many believe this video is a fake. It's certainly possible, but let's assume it's authentic and think for a moment about the explanation for how the U.S. got it. U.S. soldiers were asked to believe found this needle of a video amid the haystack of crap they found in Jalalabad as Al-Qaeda and the Taliban fled. Was this tape showing on a television or something when U.S. forces burst into the room? Here's a more plausible scenario. The U.S. has the tape because U.S. intelligence was responsible for filming it. That's the hypothesis of researcher Meyer Osiron. Based on a compelling body of evidence, he claims the CIA hired a Saudi operative, Khalid al-Harbi, to tape the confession video on or around September 26th. That's 11 days before the beginning of the Afghanistan war. This means not only that bin Laden could have been captured or killed before the war, but also that the war could have been averted. Remember that the Taliban offered to give up bin Laden to the U.S. in exchange for evidence showing that he was in fact responsible for the 9-11 attacks. The U.S. refused. You can read a more detailed account of Osiran's argument at the following URL. But here are some important elements of that argument. One, information contained in a December 16, 2001 article in the UK Guardian directly implies that the video resulted from a U.S.-led sting operation. Two, Tony Blair claimed in a BBC report in late September 2001 that he had been shown, quote, powerful and incontrovertible, unquote, evidence that bin Laden was behind the attacks. Three, the lack of documentation from the Department of Defense when pressed to certify both the chain of custody for the video from the time it was found to the time it was aired in the media, as well as the authentication process the video underwent. Four, technical aspects of the video related to its editing and its electronic transmission indicate that the official story is highly questionable. Understand the significance of this. If Osiran is correct, the U.S. purposely waged an unnecessary war. Rather than capture bin Laden, the U.S. military chose to use him for propaganda purposes. He became the face of the Afghanistan war, just as Saddam Hussein became the face of the Iraq war. We now know the Bush administration lied us into the Iraq war. The true story of the bin Laden confession video may prove they also lied us into the Afghanistan war. The Defense Department must be compelled to account for the origin of the video as well as the authentication process it underwent. Hope to see you next week. Some pretty contentious stuff, but stuff that actually seems to line up with the facts as we know them. And once again, I would stress that in order to really delve into this properly, you would need to look at those articles and uh, other things that have been mentioned in that video, and also that I am going to put in the documentation for for this episode, because it is a very uh, detailed story once you begin to look into it. But suffice it to say, it does appear to be a genuine tape of someone who is genuinely Osama bin Laden, and... That does raise a lot of the questions, uh, how this tape was acquired and what it really indicates. And if it was the result of a sting operation, then that means the U.S. intelligence had access to Osama bin Laden somehow, in some way, even through a third party uh, in the time between 9-11 and the time that the, uh, the Afghan bombing began. And that means that they, well, surprise, surprise, they had Osama bin Laden and they failed to take him. I wonder why. Well, of course, we already know that Osama bin Laden is the perfect boogeyman for their Orwellian system, but there you go. Uh, just more indication of the complete stand-down that took place not only before 9-11, not only on the day of 9-11, but also after 9-11 in the numerous opportunities that the U.S. had to nab Osama bin Laden, including potentially this time when they could have nabbed him, but they decided to try to sting him for the propaganda purposes of being able to wage a war by showing the confession tape. Now, again, there, there's a lot to go through here, but 
Let's turn now to an interview that I conducted earlier today with the researcher who was talked about in that video, and that is Maher Osaran, an Arab-American researcher at MyDemocracy.net who devoted a year of his life to researching this video and trying to get to the bottom of it. And his story is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So suffice it to say, there will not be time to really get into all of the details in the excerpt that I'll be able to play on today's episode, which is why I wholeheartedly urge you to go and listen to the interview in its entirety. And there are some points at which I think Mr. Osaran and I might diverge in our assessment, but at any rate, I think that his work on the video itself is completely spot on. So very interesting work that he's done here, and work that uh, seems to fit the facts as we know them a lot more closely than the standard version that it's a fat person portraying Osama bin Laden in the video, which actually just begins to look and sound ridiculous when you bother to actually watch the video. So without setting it up too much, let's get into at least the beginning of my interview with Maher Osaran about his work on the Fat Bin Laden confession video. Let's set the stage for this and make sure everyone's on the same page because I'm sure that some people in the listening audience may not remember the video or the details surrounding it. So, so let's talk a little bit about, um, so as you mentioned, this was supposedly filmed on November 9th, 2001, as after the American uh, carpet bombing had already begun in the country. And it involves the uh, paraplegic sheikh coming to visit Osama bin Laden, supposedly. Um, t- tell people how this video was supposedly discovered in the narrative that the Pentagon put out regarding it. Well, maybe I can read directly from what Ed has. Well, basically, there were multiple stories about the discovery when it was first discovered. First, it was discovered in Jalalabad, then in Kandahar, and then this. First, uh, you know, they just happened to, you know, they had a tip, and they went there. Too many stories. But then there's the official uh, Pentagon statement that it was discovered in a safe house in Jalalabad, and uh, that's basically it. Right. So, okay, it was discovered in a in a safe house um, in the entire country. They managed to yeah, a safe house that Al Qaeda used to be in. Right. And uh, so they dra- dug this out of a drawer somewhere, supposedly, and yeah, or and, it was playing on TV when they walked into the room. Oh, I see. Wow, <laughs> coincidental. Well, um, so so then, why did it take one month for them to, or however many weeks for them to release the video, supposedly? Uh, well. My work shows that it was, you know, the, the timeline is, is quite different. Uh, the video was taped on September, around September 26, you know, plus or minus a day. And when they went into a small town in Ghazni province where Bin Laden's family lived, that's where the other portions of the tape were, uh, you know, not discovered, but that's when they got their hands on them. And those portions of the tape were sent electronically, probably via satellite, to Washington, okay, or to the Pentagon or the CIA or whoever. So we have two portions of the tape, one September 26th and one after November 2nd. The September 26th portion has analog anomalies, after November 22nd, has digital anomalies. So these two cannot be on the same tape in Jalalabad that they say they discovered in early November or mid-November. Right. So, so what, 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 what were those two parts? I mean, what was actually on that, those two separate parts of the tape? Okay. The one with the analog anomalies is the one where bin Laden is sitting and discussing 9-11. The one with the digital anomalies are actually home videos of Bin Laden's family. And his kids are featured prominently in those videos. Their names are called. Bin Laden's son is playing with the crashed helicopter wreckage. He's playing with the landing gear of the Predator. <laughs> okay. I Explain th- that for th- people, th- the Predator. Okay, well, we have, we have to, what we did is we reconstituted the video 
and put it in the proper timeline. On September 21st, no, September 21st, correct, sorry, 2001, the paraplegic sheikh left Saudi Arabia. Now, in the tape, the sheikh says that he left in a hurry, and he gave that as a reason for not supplying bin Laden at the meeting with evidence of what the scholars, the Muslim scholars, were thinking. And the only reason bin Laden accepted to see this paraplegic sheikh is because he was worried about the reaction from the Muslim scholars within Saudi Arabia. A Muslim, when he goes to war, he has to more or less give some notice to the other side that he's attacking. And if he doesn't do that, it's un-Islamic. See, so that's why a lot of times before any attacks happen by Al-Qaeda or from bin Laden, there is a video and with un, you know, veiled threats of some sort, just as a warning to, you know, to be Muslim. Now, he was interested in the reaction, but he wasn't getting it. He wanted to know what the street was thinking, what the scholars were thinking. So that's why he was sold on this visit by this guy. And since he already knew him from past interactions, he accepted to see him. Now, this guy is paraplegic, and he arrived before bin Laden did. So he had full control over this safe house where they met. Okay. And this, it's a beautiful thing, but it was originally designed, I mean, it doesn't get designed within a week or two. You know, September 21st is only 10 days after 9-11. There isn't enough time to design such a sophisticated thing. It was designed prior to 9-11. So this is what establishes prior knowledge here also of something that's going to happen that's big. So... This guy arrives, and in the tape he says, you know, I left in a rush, I'm sorry, I don't have this, I don't have that. He had nothing, okay? And he was basically, as far as I'm concerned, uh, bullshitting, if I can use this word. Uh, 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 I lost my train of thought here. So, Great. Well, okay, so, so you're, you're obviously indicating this was a sting operation that was, was set up. Sting. But w right. and you say that was planned weeks ahead of this. It was actually before nine eleven that this thing was it, actually planned. It needs about three months to prepare, to rehearse, to look at all the angles. A thing that sophisticated cannot happen within ten days. And if I remember correctly, in one of your articles, you indicated that there was a UPI article from August that had already talked about this thing. Right, and the UPI article was uh, it was leaked in uh, Pakistan. So they were probably thinking about using Pakistan as uh, the, the way to reach Afghanistan, uh, but then w they used Iran, and that's also clear in the tape. They got to Iran, and they were met at the border by one of bin Laden's confidants. He, he's actually uh, the guy who took care of bin Laden's uh, kids while bin Laden was away. He was uh, the surrogate father in a way. And his name is uh, Mukhtar. And uh, he met him at the border, and they took him to the safe house, and they passed through uh, Kabul. Now, if it, by November 9th, Kabul was a wreck. I don't think they could have done that. I mean, that was another flag that they had passed after Kabul. And even the, the paraplegic in, in the... In the tape, he says, you know, we expected bombings and we expected this and expected that. And we got all the way to the safe house without hearing a single shot. So it was, you see what I'm saying? Mm. So the, the it, it path was paved. Right. So, I mean, from the Iranian border to reaching the safe house in, uh, in Ghazni is about... 400, 500 miles, if not more. Right, it wouldn't have and happened so unless it, it was allowed to during happen. During the carpet bombing and right. going through Kabul and all of that. Right, right. Okay, uh, so, so who was participating in this sting? From the tape, we can tell that there are three individuals. 
uh, one who was a burly man who belonged to like the religious police in Saudi Arabia. He volunteered for the trip so he can carry him around in the deserts of, between Iran and Afghanistan, you know, help him out. And the, another guy who volunteered to stay, uh, you know, for the for the war effort, for the you know, to to, to stay behind and help uh, Bin Laden in the war effort. Uh, he wants to become a mujahid, basically. Uh, so, three people is what we can determine. There might have been a fourth, but. I think he does need at least one person as a paraplegic to, to travel, to get on airplanes and off and all of that stuff. And uh, from the video that was inserted into the confession segment, we can tell that at least, we can tell that one person was left behind. Because while he was taping, Mukhtar was also part of the subjects in his taping. And uh, his uh, way of taping was very much uh, not in line with the uh, home video type work that was inserted. Uh, it was uh, very random, almost like somebody wandering around aimlessly. So he was there walking around town, just surveying, taping, and somehow his work was also inserted. Once again, I will direct listeners to a number of articles that Mr. Osseron has written and also that Ed Haas of the now-defunct Muckraker Report uh, wrote about this video and its significance. And Ed Haas might be familiar to many people, if not directly, then certainly by his work uh, in the, his early stages of reporting on 9-11 where he managed to wring out of uh, FBI spokesman Rex Toom the idea that the FBI does not have 9-11 on Osama bin Laden's list of crimes on his most wanted rap sheet because he there is no hard evidence linking him to 9-11. And that is, has been something that has been picked up on and consistently and very vociferously espoused by um, numerous people in the 9-11 truth movement, but they have failed to latch on with any uh, of the same rigor to any of Ed Haas's later work where he looks into this video, for instance. Now... Again, as I said earlier, there are some divergences of opinions between myself and Mr. Osseron on this. He is going, for instance, by the ABC uh, translation of this videotape, which would seem to indicate that, yes, it is uh, Bin Laden confessing to 9-11, and it's pretty much like the Pentagon says. Um, and there was a Pentagon-issued translation as well, but the Pentagon-issued translation immediately came under criticism, and criticism from pretty interesting source. There was a German television station equivalent to NBC or BBC uh, called Das Erst, which did a report on December 20th of 2001 on the translation of this, uh, the Pentagon provided translation of this confession video. And here is a very interesting uh, place to begin deconstructing what this video might, uh, where the real manipulation of this video might lie, might lie. And we'll take a look at an article called Mistranslated Osama Bin Laden Video, The German Press Investigates, by Craig Morris. Quote, A German TV show found that the White House's translation of the confession video was not only inaccurate, but even manipulative. On December 20, 2001, German TV channel Das Erst broadcast its analysis of the White House's translation of the OBL video that George Bush has called a confession of guilt. On the show Monitor... Two independent translators and an expert on Oriental studies found the White House's translation not only to be inaccurate, but manipulative. Arabist Dr. Abdel L. M. Husseini, one of the translators, states, I have carefully examined the Pentagon's translation. This translation is very problematic. At the most important places where it is held to prove the guilt of bin Laden, it is not identical with the Arabic. Whereas the White House would have us believe that OBL admits that we calculated in advance the number of casualties from the enemy, Translator Dr. Murad Alami finds that in advance is not said. The translation is wrong, at least when we look at the original Arabic, and there are no misunderstandings to allow us to read it into the original. At another point, the White House translation reads, We had notification since the previous Thursday that the event would take place that day. Dr. Murad Alami, Previous is never said. The subsequent statement that this event would take place on that day cannot be heard 
in the original Arabic version. The White House's version also includes the sentence, we asked each of them to go to America, but Alami says the original formulation is in the passive, along the lines of, they were required to go. He also says that the sentence afterwards, they didn't know anything about the operation, cannot be understood. Professor Gernot Rotter, professor of Islamic and Arabic studies at the Asia-Africa Institute at the University of Hamburg, sums it up. The American translators who listened to the tapes and transcribed them apparently wrote a lot of things in that they wanted to hear, but that cannot be heard on the tape no matter how many times you listen to it. Meanwhile, the U.S. press has not picked up on that story at all, reporting instead that a new translation has revealed that OBL even mentions the names of some of those involved. But the item is all over the German press, from Germany's Channel 1, Das Erst, the ones who broke the story, equivalent to NBC or the BBC, to ZDF, Channel 2, to Der Spiegel, the equivalent of Time or The Economist, end quote. Well, there is a very interesting piece of a puzzle to look at, at any rate, and as I say, Maher Osaran does not believe that there is any real fundamental problems in the translation and does believe that it is an actual confession of Osama bin Laden to knowing about and helping to mastermind the attacks of 9-11. Personally, I, obviously I don't speak Arabic, so I have no uh, direct opinion or no uh, direct input on the matter, but I think it is at least worth looking into and something that we should be pursuing, well, how about these translators? How about other Arabic translators? It's nine years after the release of this, in fact, ten years almost, after the release of this video, and still the 9-11 Truth Movement hasn't followed up on this incredible lead on something very important because they've been distracted by calling this video a fake or calling the a fat bin Laden video without bothering to actually look into the tape at all. In fact, I would... Im- I would imagine that the majority of people who just refer, dismiss this as the Fat Bin Laden video have not seen the video. And so speaking of someone who has, I can say that it is definitely Osama Bin Laden, or at least a, a mighty, mightily well-done computer-generated image. And I say that because uh, kind of flippantly because I, I don't believe that that is the case in this case. And at any rate, there is also other indications that, well, what we see and hear might not, in fact, be what is really there. And uh, that comes from an article from the day after the release of the video uh, from Counterpunch called Osama Gump, and it's by Yusuf Aga. And uh, basically, he's writing to say that uh, the audio tracks, especially in the key parts where uh, bin Laden is supposedly confessing to guilt, well, the audio is uh, is not very fuzzy and very difficult to hear, but when other people walk into the room, suddenly the audio is crystal clear. And he was uh, basically making the point that it uh, very much could could have been some audio manipulation going on too. So we have the translation problems, we have possible audio problems, we have lots of other things that we could be looking at as a 9-11 truth movement if we don't want to accept this as an Osama bin Laden confession video. But still, I think we have to at least face the fact that it is Osama bin Laden. And until we do that, and until uh, the the people who are researching this actually start to give it that type of attention and start to really pick it apart and look at what is really going on in this video, well, then we've pretty much ceded the ground to the enemy because they will undoubtedly be able to take the rather ridiculous notion that this is not Osama bin Laden and to throw that in our face. Now, when you start to look at the 2004-2007 computer-generated animations of Osama bin Laden and the uh, the, the dyed beard and the, uh, the exact same wardrobe and the exact same camera angle and the exact same lighting three years apart and all of that and when he's hiding out in his cavern, cavern fortress, well, that's when we start getting into absolute cartoonville and uh, the, the manipulations and the fakery of the videos becomes obvious. But this 2001 video is not on that same level and it is something very different and something that we have to take a look at squarely. Otherwise, we will not be able to adequately refute it, not to really refute it in a way that will convince people who actually bother themselves to go and look at the video. Because ultimately, I think that's what this is about. This is about a gut check. This is about being honest with ourselves. And it's extremely easy for the 9-11 Truth Movement and others to sit there and say, well, this is not really Osama bin Laden, therefore we don't have to deal with what's on the video. It's much more difficult if we have to actually think about this and put it into context. And once you start to take a look at these facts, I trust that you will come to the same judgment that this is an actual video and we have to look at what it's actually trying to tell us. And... Again, there's much too much to go into on that front uh, to go into it in any great detail right now. But again, I have faith in my listeners that they'll be able to piece these things together for themselves. 
And once again, I'd like to stress that I am not here on some cloud saying that I am perfect and everyone should listen to me but should not trust themselves. Quite the contrary, I am saying that I myself am constantly reevaluating what I know or what I think I know in the face of new evidence, and my opinion on the Fat Bin Laden video is one example of that. It's something that I have promoted on this vi- this podcast before as something that was clearly a fake video, and yet now I don't believe that to be the case. I think that, that at least the video itself seems to be legitimately a video of Osama bin Laden, and there are the indications that uh, Maher Asaran have pointed out, and which I, I think are absolutely convincing, that this was secretly, covertly filmed and undoubtedly part of a U.S. intelligence sting operation, which opens up a whole new avenue of investigation, and one that Well, I will be pursuing uh, to the extent that I'm able here at the Corbett Report, and I certainly hope others will be joining me in that. But again, uh, we are just going to have to keep reevaluating our best evidence and putting our, trying to build our house, our structure that we want to build up on the firmest possible footing so that it cannot be blown down by the, the hungry little wolves that come along trying to blow down our house of, of, of straw. Well, at any rate, that's a rather elaborate analogy to leave things on today, and there's been a lot of heavy information in today's episode, so I certainly hope you will, as always, go and not trust me and not trust anyone else, but go and actually look at the documentation for today's episode for yourself and come to your own conclusions based on the best available evidence. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com support.